From the earliest accounts of recorded history, it seems almost all civilizations have been obsessed with the possibility of predicting the future. And we need to remain lost in the mystery and recognise that the fascinating thing about our journey with God is to find as much by things that we don't know as things that we do know. So let's remain open so that we can experience the joy of God revealing things to us. And let's not be so dogmatic in our beliefs that we deny ourselves the joyful experience of faith. Let's all join together now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. He's a priest. Did he even know about me? For telling the future is different to predictions of probability like rolling a dice, winning the lottery, or even tossing a coin. Probability in the strict mathematical or statistical sense is a game of chance and really what you're doing there in terms of probability is trying to make sense out of things that appear to be completely random. Sure, a coin may only have two sides so it's better odds, but it's still only a 50-50 chance and that's still a gamble. The scientific way of knowing things is based really on a limited set of our senses, the five senses and experimental and observational evidence. And yet there are many things that we don't understand even in science in terms of our minds, how our minds work, how we perceive things, how do we get inspiration for example. All of these sorts of questions even in science we don't fully understand. So why is it that we find it so difficult to mix our science with perhaps theology, with things that we don't understand, with, with the way that we understand that God works? A complex mathematical matrix can't predict the stock market, let alone the future. So how is it that someone can accurately predict events that are impossible to calculate? These questions fascinated one of the greatest scientific minds to ever exist, Sir Isaac Newton. He's well known for his astounding achievements in science. Though a critic of accepted Trinitarian dogmas and the Council of Nicaea, Newton's religious convictions ran deep, as did his acceptance of the Bible. It's difficult, I guess, for us to understand in our culture, but in the 17th century it was quite the norm to have science and mathematics um, developed within the context of theology. Isaac Newton put his religion first and that anything that he did in science was interpreted in terms of that um, mindset that he had. He was also one of the greatest believers in prophecy and studied the Bible extensively to examine its role as an authentic prophetic document. Newton investigated the history and the chronological records of ancient societies, cross-checking one country's date and events against another's, and against time-based prophecies from the ancient world. Much of this research took place where he studied and taught as Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University. Prophecy certainly has a logical foundation and it can be tested um, it can be um, deciphered in a sense it's mathematical, scientific, but also um, the heart of prophecy is Jesus Christ. And so there is definitely a faith element as well. Sir Isaac Newton's search for the truth about whether the Bible can predict the future is a universal one. Can we know the future? And if so, what implications does that have for the present? Are we part of a bigger plan 
or are we just free will creatures doing our own thing? I think this is one of the reasons why science is attractive to a lot of people because it, it gives them an assurance. It gives them um, the ability to be able to predict and bring order to their lives as opposed to something that's completely random, a completely random event that you can't control or you can't explain, I think people find rather frightening. It's a fundamental human question. Look at the success of books and films, both fiction and non-fiction, in the search for meaning. There are countless philosophical points of view. Religious books, spiritual books, populist books, like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and The Da Vinci Code, to name a couple. Everyone has a desire to know where they fit in for security, happiness and purpose of life. The world is just changing so quickly. What was happening yesterday is different today and will be very different tomorrow. And uh, people uh, in this great change are sensing a loss of control in their own lives. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my children, to my family? People want to know what there is behind a conspiracy or a secret or something and so the future is the biggest one of those and so everyone wants to know what the future is. People have always wanted to know the future, that's uh, part of the nature of us and the sort of species we are. We're a, we're a pattern recognising species and we, uh, uh, as far as we know, are the only ones that have intimations of our own mortality. We know that we're going to die sometime. For the last six months I've worked in a palliative care hospital, which is essentially a hospice for people who are dying. I work there as one of the doctors and the most common question I get asked is how long, how much time do I have? It's a really difficult question to answer because I don't know. People want to know how long they've got, they want to know so that they can make the most of the time that they have, be that spend time with family, go on the world trip they've wanted to go on, set right any wrongs that may have happened in their lives. They want to know how much time they've got. Hey. Um, we, um, we just got the results back from the lab and I don't know how much time she has left. We look for reassurance and uh, being able to have somebody telling you that the future is bright, it's uh, psychologically you're inclined to believe it. It's the same as if people tell you things about yourself. If they tell you nice things about yourself, you're much more likely to believe them if they, and than if they tell you you're a mongrel or a ratbag. Within modern mainstream culture today, we find many purported answers about the future. Astrology predictions, tarot card readings, fortune tellers, palm readers, some of which come at quite a cost. Belief in uh, palmistry, astrology, um, numerology, those sort of things is quite irrational, but I can certainly understand why people do it. Well, lots of things can't be proven, but I've got to have a reason to believe something. I don't believe things just because uh, it, it might become popular, for instance. I think that's the way most people run most of their lives, actually, otherwise we'd all fall prey to uh, charlatans and con men and that sort of thing. Uh, I take it a bit broader, as do most sceptics. Uh, we, we just need evidence before we believe things. Think, for example, about your microwave oven and the fact that you don't have to really understand the way in which the oven works to be able to use it in a useful way to cook your, your meals and so on. So people have then the idea that perhaps if there is a perception that someone does understand what the, pre the future is, whether it's in astrology or s some of these other things, people are willing to put their trust in those people. They understand perhaps or they have the perception that these people can give them assurance in the same analogy that they understand that the microwave oven will be able to produce the results even though they don't understand the way that it works they obviously fill a void, otherwise there wouldn't be so much talk about all of them. Um, whether or not they're filling the void with something that can blend with reality is another question. But if we want to foretell the future, 
Are these options or is there something better? The word prophecy means prediction. A prophet was someone who was able to predict the future. Most scholars agree that the Bible is prophetic. With many of the prophecies yet to be fulfilled and some yet to be deciphered. To understand Bible prophecy, we must first acknowledge that some of the Bible is written in parables and symbols. It's like using secret codes in wartime. They can only be understood and interpreted using the correct symbols and keys. The Bible writers knew their audience, and they knew that if they said, the ships of the Kittim, and we don't really know for certain what that means, they knew their audience would know what it meant. It's vague to us, but it's highly unlikely that it was vague to them. It was a kind of, you know what I mean. In other words, the biblical writers sometimes write in language that is obscure to us, but may not have been obscure to them. To me, the most important principle about biblical prophecy is it was the word of God for them to whom these documents were originally written in the first place. It was a revelation for them that they were supposed to be able to at least partially understand in the first century AD. These are not prophecies written exclusively for late Western Christians at the end of the 20th or the beginning of the 21st century, which only we now, with new insight in multicolored charts, could make sense of. This is absolutely false. I wish to confess well, I think that I, th I think that you might. Well, I think I'm. I'm your daughter. Who are you? Why are you making these accusations? I, I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. This is a mistake. <laughs> If you're going to come into my church and make these accusations, uh, at least tell me who you are. You should have told me. I shouldn't have had to ask. Why should I have had to ask? You know, much of the Bible deals with real historical events, like the history of the Jews and the rise and fall of empires such as Egypt and Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome. Yet nearly one third of the Bible is prophecy. Some of these prophecies use symbolic language or codes, but the Bible also contains keys to its own codes, which makes Bible prophecy an exciting study for many people. There's a lot of symbolism in the Bible, and uh, that makes it an interesting book to read, really. I think that's why God had it that way. And so the very fact that he used days symbolizing years is nothing to be surprised at. After all, the Bible itself says in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 that a day represents a year. So uh, the Bible is consistent with itself, and if God chooses to do it that way, well, it's a good way to do it, I think. What's interesting to me about biblical prophecy is, and the way I like to put it, is that God reveals to us enough of the future to give us hope, but not so much about the future that we don't have to have faith. I think there's a lot to be gained from the Bible that's not in prophecy. So if you're, like, if you're not intellectual in that sense, then no, you don't have to dig into the prophecies. But I have gained a lot from reading prophecy, and I think it gives assurance about the future and what is there and how safe we can feel in spite of predictions about the future. Imagine trying to write the life story of the Prime Minister of Australia 500 years before he was born. 
I mean, how would you know where he would be born and what year he would come into office and how long he would be the leader of Australia? Consider the following messianic prophecies which were all fulfilled in the life and death of Jesus. In biblical times, wise men who studied prophecy knew several hundred years prior to Christ's birth that he would be born in a town called Bethlehem. They knew he would be betrayed by one of his inner circle for a sum of 30 pieces of silver. And they also knew he would be crucified on a cross, which is a remarkable prediction because it was the Roman Empire who introduced crucifixion as a form of execution hundreds of years after the prophecy was written. Jews would stone people as a form of corporal punishment, but here is a prediction that goes against the times in which it was made. How did the prophets know these things? Now, some say the Jews wrote it into the scriptures after the events occurred. But how then were these predictions included in the Dead Sea Scrolls written long before Christ's birth and death? All the way back to the third century AD, there's been a conflict as to whether the prophecies in the Bible are the real deal or fate. I think it really does come down to a large extent to the presuppositions with which you come to the documents. If you come to the documents with the presupposition that prophecy doesn't happen, or if it does, it only happens one time in ten, and only the correct prophecies get remembered, that's why it's all good. If you come with that premise, you'll probably leave with that premise as well. If you come and say, well, let's have an open mind here, then some of the things in the Bible have got to have a chance to say, hey, here's a claim. We think this is prophetic. Now, I'm not going to generalise. I'll just say that in principle, you ought not to exclude the idea that prophecies could happen and rule it out from the start. You ought to examine case by case. One of the most amazing messianic prophecies was Daniel's prediction about the coming Messiah. It was this prophecy that captivated Sir Isaac Newton. He studied the book of Daniel closely and wrote a book on the logic of predictive prophecy, which can still be found 250 years later. It's even available in online bookstores. In it he concludes, for the event of things predicted ages before will then be a convincing argument that the world is governed by providence. For Isaac Newton to write that, it shows really, um, well, it shows his culture, doesn't it? It shows his background in theology. And it shows his persistence, really, to bring his science to bear to try and support scripture, which is his, was his whole aim of pursuing his, his science. Daniel's most famous prediction was set in Jerusalem and involves the date that the Anointed One, the Messiah, would appear. Daniel prophesied that after the Babylonians overthrew the Jewish state, a decree would be issued to restore and build Jerusalem. He also prophesied that at a specific time following this event, the Messiah would appear. In Daniel's time, around about 550 BC, Jerusalem had been destroyed. It would have been unthinkable at that time that the city would ever be rebuilt. Most cities were pillaged, destroyed and then forgotten. However, in 457 BC, it happened. The Medo-Persians seized power and Artaxerxes Longimanus gave the decree that allowed Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Daniel 9 is an extremely important prophecy of the Old Testament because it contains three key elements of the faith of Israel. The Messiah, the city of Jerusalem, and its temple. And the prophecy of Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27 make very clear that depending upon Israel's response to the Messiah, the fate of their city and temple would be determined. Now, according to Newton, it was this event which led to the beginning of Daniel's time prophecy, which was seven lots of seven plus 62 lots of seven, which equaled 69 lots of seven, or 483 years. Now if we believe that the time prophecy began in the year 457 BC, 483 years would bring us down to the year 27 AD. Now calendars may vary, 
but 27 AD is widely accepted as the starting date for the public ministry of Jesus. Well, what about these sevens? Jewish culture measured time in sevens. Just as every seventh day was a Sabbath day of rest, so every seventh year was a sabbatical year or Sabbath year. They measured time in sevens as naturally as we do in decades. There is a lot more detail on this prophecy, but Newton's conclusion was that Daniel accurately predicted events centuries before they happened. For Newton, this was strong evidence for belief in a God who was intelligent enough to know the future. The second half of Newton's life was devoted to investigating Bible prophecy. He deduced that Daniel's prediction was the foundation stone of the Christian religion. It's fascinating to think that such a great scientific mind concluded that there are extraordinary prophecies yet to take place and there is hope for eternal life through Jesus. So, um, when did she tell you that I might be your father? Uh, uh, she didn't. I just found out. I never knew. Where is she now? Well, is all this and the prophecies that we've been talking about a mere matter of chance? Or is it a code that was meant to be broken, written by a God who wants us to experience the joy of life and to continue to seek the truth? I wrote to your mother to tell her of my decision, but uh, I never heard from her since. She must have known about you then. And then I came back from Rome about 10 years later. And I've been the parish priest here for the last 15. Do you think we should get a, a DNA test? No, card? no, no, I can see that. I write about this in the parish newsletter. Excuse me. Hello? Everything all right? Hey, um, if you want to leave me here, that's all right. Um, no, I'd like it if you came in. vital signs are fading. This past hour she seems to be hallucinating. She's only lucid at certain moments. Um, she's about to leave us, Sarah. Come. Uh, 
Yeah, so we can make anything, okay? Thank you. Okay. I'm here. It's Sarah. David's here with me. Prophecy gives us understanding of the importance of Jesus' life. It reminds us of the value of his death and the purpose for human existence. Prophecy also gives us confidence as we read the Bible and shows that our trust in Jesus is not misplaced. Unlike the concocted conspiracy theories and mystique of Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, and similar books and films, The Christian Code doesn't deal in dark secrets played out by shadowy figures. The Christian Code rather deals with the certainties of answering the big questions of life, both for the now and for the future. By trusting in the Bible, it not only provides answers, but more importantly, hope for the future of life after death. Sir Isaac Newton was so impressed by the prophecy of the 70 weeks that he called it the foundation stone of the Christian religion. You know, the story of Jesus shows that there is a plan for everyone.